Good evening and welcome to Powder Baptist Chapel for our evening service for Sunday the 16th of August that will go out on Wednesday the 19th of August. My name's Adam and I'm one of the pastors at the church. Whether you've been at PBC all your life or you're just tuning in for the first time today, you are so welcome and we're delighted you're listening. Even if we're separated by COVID or by oceans, it's great that we can be together in this way. Our preacher tonight is Dave Roberts. He's a church member here at PBC, but by his accent, you can tell he's originally from Australia. Dave runs Partake Ministries, through which hundreds of thousands of talks and other material are downloaded all around the world. And as they seek people, um, seek to help people on the journey with Jesus. Dave's married to Yongmi, originally from Korea. So Annyeong Hasio to all our Korean friends as well. It's so wonderful to be part of God's family, the church, with brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world. I'm now going to hand over to Dave to introduce himself a bit more, to pray and to share with us tonight. G'day. Welcome to Pound of Baptist Chapel. My name is Dave Roberts. Uh, I am married to the amazing young me. And together we've been involved with PBC since 2006 and my second year at Moreland's College where for my dissertation I was investigating the role of Internet Church. We are members now of PBC and we are also mission partners with them through our ministry partakers. Pounder Chapel send us out into the world, online and offline, to help people find and follow Jesus. And we can do that, one person at a time, the whole world. Wow. With that said, let's study God's Word together now, and it would be handy if you have your Bible with you, or indeed your love Ringwood New Testament. Let's start with prayer together, because as you know, that's always a very good place to start. Father God, as we commence, give us ears to hear you speak to us. We thank you for your written word, the Bible, which reveals to us your living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us now, O oh God, to learn more about you, learn more about your church, and learn more about each other in how we can serve you, serve each other, and love you and other people even more. And all of God's people said, Amen. Well, this COVID-19 pandemic has certainly caused people and nations of the world, even enemies of each other, to globally stop and think together. It's certainly true of the church, as you are aware, because this is going straight to YouTube instead of being done physically up at Pounder Chapel as part of a worship service. I know some people who didn't think that Internet Church was really church. That is, until now. They soon changed their minds, including at least one former staff member of Moreland's College, who before all of this described church online as nonsense. He's changed his mind. I've seen the evidence. I don't know when you are viewing or listening to this, but if you are in the year 2021, or even the year 2121, a few months ago, things changed almost overnight in the way that most people engaged with church, and also church practiced, was changed. Let's have our first reading now, and it comes in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. If you have your love Ringwood New Testament, it can be found on page 20. Please do keep your Bibles open after each reading so you can check what I am saying against it. Over to Harry now, another member of Pounder Chapel, who is going to be doing our Bible readings for us. Over to you, Harry. Hello, friends. I'm Harry. I've been going to PBC for about 18 months now, properly. Visited a few times before then. And actually on the day of recording, I've just found out that I've been accepted as a member of the church. So that's really exciting. Um, very sorry, but also thank you. Uh, this reading is Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20. 
When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Thanks, Harry. Here in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus' true identity is divulged when the Apostle Peter calls him the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of the living God. This is a climactic part of the Gospel accounts of Jesus Christ. Jesus' mission was to be the servant of the Lord and therefore the Saviour of the world as God's Son. Jesus at this time was on his way to Jerusalem and teaching his apostles how he must suffer and die and be resurrected to life after three days. We looked at that together back in March when I last spoke here. We also know that this Jesus is gathering people uh, to himself even now to follow him and to who look wholeheartedly to him alone. That is the church, past, present and future. It's been 2,000 years so far and people's past, present and future who are following Jesus are the church historically and globally. Can it be said that you are following Jesus Christ? And if you're not, it's not too late. Now let's look together, particularly at verse 18, where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus Christ is building his church and nothing will stand in its way. This is one of the things constantly on my mind since March. Therefore, another question, what is the church? Church is an assembly or group of people called out by God for God and for God alone. When Jesus says that I will build my church here in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, he does so because he is the head of the church and the church is the body. It is to Jesus Christ alone that we the church are to submit ourselves as he gives leadership, provides unity and who is the ultimate authority. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church, and as Christians, his people, his body, we are to be obedient to him. There are two aspects of church. Firstly, there is the universal church, which is the entire body of Jesus Christ, which consists of all believers of all time until Jesus comes back again. Then secondly, there is the local church, or the visible church, which is the body of Christ, which is in physical action in the world, and this is the local congregation, such as here at Pounder Baptist. And there are three main aspects in the relationship between Jesus and his church. The church is the body of Christ. The church is a living organism, and not merely an organisation. All Christians are baptised into one body, the universal church, and this body is made up of many parts or believers who have a vitally necessary and important function to perform to the glory of God. And secondly, the, the church is the bride of Christ, which suggests that purity, holiness and faithfulness, which should be the hallmark of God's people. Furthermore, it suggests the great love that Jesus Christ has for the church. The church who is his bride. And then thirdly, the church is the temple of Christ. 
Jesus Christ is building the church, a spiritual temple with himself as the cornerstone or the foundation stone. Christians, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, are living stones and God dwells within the temple, filling it with his fullness. Wow! Isn't that splendaciously fantabulous? And what's more, he wants you and I to be part of it. Wow! So what's the purpose of the church? The church is empowered by God to build up God's people to spiritual maturity, to equip God's people for service, to tell others about this amazing God, and to follow him. The church is to glorify God, and the church is to promote the welfare of all people, spiritual and physical, and to speak out for justice for all. Not just for those inside the church, but also for those outside of it. Can that be described as being evident in our life as individual Christians? as well as in the life of Powell Baptist Chapel, or indeed the churches together in Ringwood. Another question now. How is Jesus Christ building the church? Over to Harry again now for our next reading from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, which can be found on page 37 of your Love Ringwood New Testament. Again, over to you, Harry. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Here are Jesus' final command and words to his disciples. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' authority is a major theme. Authority in action and not just merely in words. Now before he ascends back to the right hand of the Father, Jesus gives specific instructions here to all his followers not just the people before him. Jesus' authority as expressed here is over all things, all people, all circumstances and happenings, including all spiritual beings, whether they be angels or demons. Jesus has authority over all nations, governments and rulers. Jesus has the authority. And that means that we his body, the church, whatever we face, Jesus is in control as we seek to serve him and give him control. Pandemics included. And I know that that's a very easy thing to forget. Here Jesus says, you go and tell the whole world about me. And history records that the early church exploded numerically as his disciples exercised Jesus' authority and power. And we today as the church are part of the result of their faithfulness and obedience. We read about the growth of the early church in the book of Acts. That growth is continuing through to this day. Someone I know in Pakistan told me this week that they had 400 adults and 50 children come to know God personally through Jesus Christ. They had become Christians. Another report by the Evangelical Alliance in the UK showed that by survey, up to 70% of churches have reported growth since the pandemic started and that their services have gone online. It also showed 80% of the survey churches 
are also actively meeting the physical needs of vulnerable people struggling during the coronavirus pandemic, the vast majority of whom are working in partnership with local authorities, other churches or charities. Praise God! What they were doing before, I don't know. In obedience to Jesus Christ's command here, all Christians are to tell others of the goodness of God, where the church is reflecting Jesus' whole mission of calling people back to life in God through evangelism and making disciples of Jesus Christ. Evangelism is showing and telling other people of God's message of love and reconciliation to all people of all time throughout the world and of all nations in all ways possible. And if people know you and I are Christians, they will be watching how we behave, conduct ourselves in life and through our words, through our actions. And every one of us Christians are a witness for God, whether we want to be or not. We can be good witnesses or bad witnesses. So let's be good witnesses for Jesus Christ, online and offline. With that said, what is our motivation? What is our motivation for evangelism to be? Well, the prime motivation for evangelism is out of gratitude for what God has done for us, in that we love because he first loved us. We are all to do the work of an evangelist, even though not everybody has the specific gift of being an evangelist like Billy Graham. But we are not just to evangelize. We are also to disciple, and that seems to be, to me at least, a forgotten word of the 21st century church. In those last words we heard from Matthew's Gospel, all Christians, including you and I, are to make disciples throughout the whole earth. And making disciples is not just evangelism. It is also ensuring that guidance and care is given to new Christian disciples. I wonder if you were discipled. I know that I was as a baby Christian. And after this, in other accounts, we know that Jesus ascended into the heavens back to the right hand of God the Father. So how is this great commission achieved and the impetus given. How can we as Christian disciples today exhibit Jesus' authority and power in evangelism? Here's a clue. He hasn't left the church without help. That's the part of the Holy Spirit. That's part of his role whom Jesus said would come once he had ascended back to the right hand of God the Father. We read about the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit comes to baptise, fill, indwell, transform, live inside, empower and motivate the church, that is all Christians. The Holy Spirit is involved with ministering to members of the church. Part of doing this is where the Holy Spirit equips the church, equips Christians for service of God and other people. That's been mentioned before in recent services. And this work of the Holy Spirit continues to this day in various ways throughout the church. Church local and church global. God is at work in his body, the church, and how is God using you as a Christian for his service? How available are you to his calling upon you? And through the life of the church, down through time, all the followers of Jesus Christ, and not just those early apostles, have been able to do all manner of things for the glory of Jesus Christ because they were baptised and controlled by the Holy Spirit. 
This Holy Spirit who empowered and delivered the early disciples' passion for making Jesus Christ known. The early church was dynamic and seemed to be exercising the authority of Jesus Christ as it spread throughout the Roman Empire and the known world at the time. This was done by telling others the good news about Jesus being the long-awaited for Messiah. Not just for the Jewish people, but for Gentiles also. And the disciples exercised Jesus' authority by submitting themselves to him and relying upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who empowers all believers for the service and glory of Jesus. Amazing. This Holy Spirit is still at work today. And if you're a Christian today, you are a result of the work of God the Holy Spirit, restoring you into a dynamic and intimate relationship of love with God. Again, wow! Have you witnessed this for yourself, locally and globally and nationally? Have you witnessed it within a group of gathered people in your own life as an individual? And what is the ministry of the Holy Spirit and what relevancy does he have to do with us as Christians today? Just four things quickly. The Holy Spirit fills. This speaks of the Holy Spirit controlling or dominating our lives. The imperative here is that we are to be filled and to go on being filled and controlled by him. The Holy Spirit gives power to enable us to evangelize. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell. God lives inside each Christian through the Holy Spirit. For without the Holy Spirit, a person cannot be a Christian. Then there's his sealing or ownership over us. The Holy Spirit indwelling the Christian is assured proof of that person being God's possession. The Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing future redemption, salvation and inheritance for the Christian. Then finally, the Holy Spirit equips Christians, each of us, for service. Service in some way. God is working in you to will and to act purposely according to his purposes and for his church, his Christians, his followers, you and I individually and collectively to be his witnesses to the whole world. Have you discovered your spiritual gifts? And if you have, how are you using them? That's been mentioned in previous services here. And what does this work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian look like? What signifies the relationship of the Christian to the Holy Spirit? How is the Holy Spirit seen? Let's go on now to look at three words very quickly about this transforming work of the Holy Spirit in the life of people, ordinary people like you and I. I'm sure that you can appreciate we can't go into too much detail in just one talk. Our next reading is from Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 to 13, which can be found on page 224 of your Love Ringwood New Testament. As it's being read, bear in mind that Paul is writing to a church, a collection of people, and not just an individual. So these three words apply not just to individuals like you and I, but also to the local church body. After all, that is the context in which Paul is writing here. And certainly they are applicable to us as individuals, but they are equally applicable to a church, to the local church such as PBC here today. And we forget that easily in our 21st century culture of individualism. Over to you, Harry. Colossians 1, 9-13 
For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Thanks, Harry. Our first word here is live. Live in the Spirit. Oh, Christian, are you living in the Spirit? Are you living a life which is worthy of being a follower of Jesus Christ? In doing so, God fills us with the knowledge of his will and imparts wisdom and understanding. We as Christians bear fruit for the kingdom, growing knowledge of God, empowered and strengthened, persevering with patience and being transformed by the Spirit as we live in the Spirit. We give thanks to God who has rescued us, forgiven us and considers us inheritors of his kingdom. Living in the Spirit shows that we have true life, which is found only in Jesus Christ. Again, wow! Are you a Christian? If you're not, it's not too late. Now for our next two words in our reading from Harry, which is from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 26, which can be found on page 212 of your Loveringwood New Testament. Over to you, Harry. Galatians 5, 16 to 26. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy. Drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there are, is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Thanks, Harry. And as we live in the Spirit, we Christians are being led by the Spirit and are to keep in step with the Spirit, as mentioned here in Galatians. Led by the Spirit, what does that mean? Let's listen to the wisdom of the great reformer Martin Luther. He writes, To be led by the Spirit of God means to be given a heart which gladly hears God's word and believes that in Christ it has grace and the forgiveness of sins, a heart which confesses and proves its faith before the world, a heart which seeks above all things the glory of God and endeavours to live without giving offence, to serve others and to be obedient, patient, pure and chaste, mild and gentle, a heart which, though at times overtaken in a fault, may stumble, soon rises again through repentance and ceases to sin. All these things the Holy Spirit teaches one if he hears and receives the word and does not willfully resist the Spirit. Is that your experience as a Christian of being led by the Spirit? During this pandemic lockdown, how is your time being spent in prayer and Bible study going? Is it growing and increasing? Or has it stagnated or indeed dropped off entirely? And living in the Spirit 
leads to being led by the Spirit, which in turn means we are keeping in step with the Spirit, not running ahead to do the work he has planned for us, not lagging behind so we are all caught in total and complete surprise, but keeping in step with him, listening to him, following his advice and wisdom daily, and being obedient to him. We are walking in the Spirit, allowing him to direct us, allowing him to lead us as we follow, and we allow him to exert his influence over us. To not do so is to resist or grieve him. Let that not be the case with us as a church or as individuals. And now for our final reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. It can be found on page 200 of your Love Ringwood New Testament. Over to you, Harry. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our lights and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Thanks, Harry. How can we show that we are keeping in step with the Spirit, being led by him and living in him? Let me quickly suggest just three ways in particular for the times of trouble that we are currently in. Three words, lamentation, perseverance and character. Our first word, lamentation. I was thinking of this back in May and June. How does lamenting look today? I, I don't know. My partakers team on Facebook, we had a time of lament together recently. We lamented things personally and corporately, such as the poor stewardship of the earth that we humans have exhibited and patently exhibited. We lamented the huge grief and the loss of life that this current pandemic has had and its effects globally, locally and personally. Part of our culture over the last uh, few years is that, particularly within the church, is that we don't have many songs of lament in our worship together. By comparison, almost a third of the psalms are psalms of lament. Psalm 13 is a very good uh, case in example. We know that the Old Testament prophets were not slow to lament and show grief. Lament and grief are part of the normal human experience within the church and outside it. Why is it not part of our worship today as it has been in the past? I don't know. I don't know everything. I don't know very much at all. Somebody once said that the reason for this is due to the Western Church's narrative of exaltation in health and wealth, that we're quick to proclaim victory rather than mourn the current reality. Has this pandemic changed that for us in some way or not? Mark Green from the LICC suggests to us some steps of lamentation today. He writes, we need to grieve. We need to name what is before us for what it is. Not to do so is to suppress the truth. It's to numb the emotions which God has given us. Those who are not given permission to grieve soon lose their capacity to truly rejoice in what is glorious. Similarly, I suspect that if we do not mourn what grieves God's heart, we are less likely to be intercessors and champions for change that the Father sent his Son to bring about and called us to participate in. 
Yes, the Lord is ever on his throne, and all around him the angels sing, Holy, holy, holy. Yes, after the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah writes, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. But those diamond verses of hope in the book of Lamentations are preceded by 65 verses of lament, and they are followed by even more lament. There is a time to grieve together before the Lord, and now is such a time, privately and corporately. So that's our first word, lament. Now secondly, there's perseverance. Persevering in our faith, particularly during such times of trouble in this pandemic as we currently have. And I wonder if sometimes you feel us like giving up on church and Christianity. I know people who like it. You just want to throw it all away and just be buried by whatever is burdening you. You're feeling deflated, you're troubled, you're overwhelmed. And almost everyone has felt like that at one time or another. Or at least I know that I have. It's common to all of humanity, to varying degrees. Each of us have troubles and suffering, which include those which are physical, emotional, mental or spiritual. How are we as Christians to respond to these times of trouble in our life? Whatever it is as a Christian, you are not alone in our troubles. And also, if we think about it in the light of eternity, the time of endurance through these troubles, such as this current pandemic, is but the blink of an eye. Wow! How are you and I to respond to suffering and troubles? Naturally, we either treat them too flippantly, or we take them far too seriously. And the response that God wants from his followers is that they are to be exercised by it. When we undergo any suffering or trouble, we're to commit it to God, endure it, and understand that he is ever faithful and that it will eventuate in his glory and for our own good. We are to be joyful when enduring suffering, according to the writer of James 1 verse 2. Now I admit freely that that can be pretty hard to do. But again, we as Christians are not left alone. Remember, the Holy Spirit indwells us if we are his followers, and as one of his names suggests, the Holy Spirit is the comforter, in that he provides comfort during difficult times. So, just as he perseveres with us, so are we. As Christians, we are to persevere in our relationship with God. We do this by being obedient to him. And we do this by following him. We ask questions humbly of him and expect him to answer, particularly if you and I don't understand something. Again, is that just me? We persevere in our prayers, we persevere in our relationship with God and in our relationships with other people. God will persevere with you, turning you gradually into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. God will not abandon you, but you are free to abandon him if you so desire. But if you do so, God will continue to call you back to himself. So if he perseveres, so must you and I. Going on from there, our third word, character. Character results from our persevering in our relationship with God. 
through our obedience to him and following him. As Christians, you and I are being transformed and developed, working on improving our service and being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That is God's ultimate purpose for you and I. As you've heard me say here before in the chapel, my parents thought I'd been brainwashed through my act of teenage rebellion and becoming a Christian when I went against their advice. Then over the years following, as they saw God transforming me and witnessed for themselves the changes that he was making within me, they also became followers of Jesus. All praise be to him. Let's now go on to look at some details of character which will help you to measure how much God the Holy Spirit has been free to develop your character into one which glorifies God alone, which shows that you are indeed uh, living in the Spirit, being led by Him and keeping in step with Him. Firstly, acknowledge God. Believe God. What is there in your life that you are trusting in God for that he alone can do? In your life as a Christian believer, Jesus Christ is to be number one and have the complete supremacy and glory over all things in your life. Can that be said? And there's a balanced life. Two things to keep in balance are involvement and isolation. You cannot do enough for others if you are constantly in the company of others. You also need time alone, all of us, but we are not to be as a complete hermit, shut away from those in your community if you're able to get out into your community. Thirdly, we are to model a consistent example. Modelling is the greatest unconscious form of learning what we know. Whether you like it or not, people are following you. But are you following Jesus Christ closely? Those who are following and watching you, in all probability, will not do what you tell them to do. But in all likelihood, will do what you do. They will copy you. And then lastly, servanthood. We are to serve others, all others. No excuse. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Priority is to be given to service of other people, all other people, just as Jesus exemplified. An essential part of developing character is serving. If Jesus Christ, as King, as God, could become human, could become a humble servant, and that he came to earth as a member of his own creation, then you and I can also be identified as humble servants. Again, is that the experience of both you and I. How are we doing that as individuals? Or again, exhibiting the character or nature of us as a church? How is our character as a church? That is PBC, uh, the churches together here in Ringwood, the church nationally, the church globally. Is the church wholly reflecting Jesus, whom we proclaim to love and to serve? Let's now conclude together. We have looked at church, church past, church present. We have hopefully seen together that pandemic or no pandemic, Jesus Christ is building his church and that this is an extraordinary time for the church, Christians everywhere, to support and extend the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That has been impressed upon me over these last few months. Church future. There will be a church future, and as part of his church, 
as individuals and as a local congregation of his church, we as Christians, his followers, his disciples, are being used by Jesus in all manner of ways to build his church. Church future. Are you on board? Come on board. We saw together that we are to live in the Spirit, to be led by Him as we keep in step with Him. We see that eventuated out through uh, lamentation, perseverance, and in developing character as we are being transformed into the image of Jesus. His body. Wow! And if you're already in a relationship with him, you are part of that church and you are loved. Loved by the Almighty with an almighty love. Almighty God wants to give you freedom to live a life that is worthy of him. Is Jesus your whole life and is your whole life Jesus? Does he have total authority over every aspect of your life? All aspects of life, such as relationships, family, work, bank accounts, possessions, worries and troubles. And by authority, I mean power. Jesus wants to influence every area of your life, my life, not just the certain parts that we're willing to give up, but all aspects of our life. And as we gradually come back to meeting together, uh, gathering physically, let's keep an eye out for each other and encourage each other as we come so that the, the back door of the church is closed, both here at PBC and with all those that we know. It takes more discipline to get up, get ready, get into the car and go and be part of a physical church worship service in a church than it does to engage church online. But both are valid. Let's look out to see those amongst us who are isolated or are housebound who find church online much to their benefit as they may not be able to get out to attend a church offline physically. Let's be careful and look out for each other. Let's keep perfect 2020 vision of Jesus in this year of 2020 and beyond. And finally, 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 you may not yet be a follower of this Jesus. I don't know. And if that is you, then accept his call upon you and your life. For this Jesus Christ is calling you by name, whether you believe he exists or not. And if you want more information about how to do that and doing that, then please do contact us here at the chapel. Please do know that God is calling you by name, urging you by name to return to a relationship an intimate and dynamic relationship with himself through his Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit and calling to you to himself alone. You may not get another chance. Jesus Christ wants to connect with you in an intimate, dynamic and personal loving relationship which is spiritual. Again, if that's you, please do contact us here at the chapel and find out how you can start this relationship with the living God. Remember, he's calling you by name to take all your burdens, to give you true freedom and independence and help you in all aspects of your life. God loves you. And so do we at Pounder Baptist Chapel. All that we do is to his praise alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we can spend together. And even though we may not uh, be uh, gathered together in the same physical space, we know that we are united 
through you, because you live in us through your Holy Spirit. Help us now as your church to extend your kingdom, to tell other people the good news about you, and that they may then go on to be discipled and live a life which is worthy of you. And we ask this, Father, through the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, who lives within us, seals us as your children, and unites us as family. Amen. Thanks, Dave and Harry, too, for the readings. Thanks loads for being with us this evening, everybody. Uh, remember, this, this Sunday, things are going to be a little bit different. Instead of our regular morning service online, we've got an outdoor community service in the Longstay Car Park in town from 4 till 5 o'clock. It'll be great to actually see people in the flesh, as it were. Some of you for the first time for nearly six months. But in the meantime, let's keep in step with God's Holy Spirit. God bless. Stay safe and stay in touch.